Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Center for a New American Security in downtown Washington, D.C., where we're talking to Susanna Bloom, uh, who is the fellow at the Defense Strategies and in the Defense uh, Strategies and Assessments part of CNAS, where, where you've done The Bottom Line, which is an interactive uh, budget tool, and Lauren uh, Fish, who is a research uh, uh, associate here on, on the same uh, program. And uh, you formerly were uh, worked for uh, Bob Work, uh, Deputy Defense uh, Secretary Secretary and one-time leader, august leader of uh, CNAS, and then you've got uh, Lauren Time on the Hill uh, working for Tom Cotton, uh, so you guys both know a lot about budgeting and, and was uh, the bane of your existence when you were in the, in the department. It was my joy every day, Vago, it, to it, work it, on the defense budget, absolutely was. Uh, it, it is, and I'm sure everybody on the Hill says the exact same thing, but uh, what you guys have done is actually a tremendous thing. Uh, it's very, very interactive. You've got sort of the macro defense budget picture, which you've released. You've released the Air Force budget and the Army budget, and so everybody's got to wait for the Navy Marine Corps budget. But talk to us a little bit about what you guys were trying to achieve with this, because when you when you see it, it's it's utterly fascinating, for example, to see the Air Force budget, the procurement budget, and then see, for example, how large that classified part of the budget is. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys were trying to achieve and what some of the key takeaways are. Sure. What we really wanted to do was make the defense budget accessible to the public. You know, so the department puts out a lot of information and a lot of data, but it's not in a particularly user-friendly kind of format. And what we wanted to do was be able to show people, here's what's actually in there at different levels of aggregation, right? So how much is the Army spending on aircraft versus ground vehicles? And then if you want another level of detail, how much is the Army spending on UH-60s? versus, you know, Abrams upgrades, right? We can get you all the way down to the program level. That was the idea. And, and that's a tremendous amount of work that goes into that. So, Lauren, I just wanted to get your take as well. Yeah, absolutely. We are hoping that this tool is useful not only for lay people or people who might be new to the defense budget, but also to people who are going to be end users. So people have that have to be able to dive into the details, either on the Hill or in the building, and kind of know what's going on. We hope everyone can use it. Uh, and I love that, you know, lay people, you know, as opposed to seasoned people of the cloth here uh, when it comes to, like, defense budgeting. Um, so what are some of the key takeaways, Susanna, that, that you have? I mean, you know, you, you work this there, you know, it didn't matter how, who was going to win, there was going to be more money for defense. It looks like, you know, we're looking at more money for defense, but then the challenge is how quickly they can absorb it and how long this run is. But as you look at the budget, what did you think, what are things that even surprised you as somebody who's so familiar with yeah. this? So the, this budget request is about $40 billion more than the, FY, the original FY18 request uh, from this administration. And I think that what's truly surprising is you know, $40 billion sounds like a lot of money. It doesn't go as far as you'd expect. Once you take off inflation 2% and take out uh, consistent cost growth above inflation in the personnel and maintenance accounts driven by rising health care costs and these broader economic trends that are happening, you really only have about $20 billion of quote unquote new money to be able to spend. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, given the challenges facing the department, the fact that this administration has put out a strategy that, that if anything, expands the roles and missions of the Department of Defense, uh, you know, the services are still stressed. Lauren? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, this budget, however, does align, in our view, to the National Defense Strategy, which re-emphasized the Department of Defense on the major great power competition, namely China and Russia. Do you, um, do you guys think that there's, uh, seeing as how you're a bipartisan team, uh, you know, a Democrat and a Republican that's, that's working this, do you guys see a sustained defense budget increase? Do you see a couple of years? I mean, Adam Smith and a number of other members have been very clear that they think this is going, you know, that that actually we may have only 18 months of budget left, so it's a twofold problem. Can the department absorb the amount of money that has been given? That's the first part. The second part is, is there going to be enough money? Because if you look at the challenges, you know, it's a trillion dollar nuclear modern, you know, we were joking about, you know, the age of the nuclear infrastructure. It is antiquated. Uh, if you look at it, the space enterprise has to be revitalized. We're trying to build to a 355-ship fleet. The Army is thinking about reinvesting its, uh, reinventing itself. And then the Air Force is struggling to make sure that it gets all of its major programs there. Talk to us a little bit about what kind of forecast you guys see as you look out. Yeah, the department took a really interesting step in, in their submission this year for 19, in that in the normal bar chart that shows the you know requests and actuals over a number of years, they actually projected out to the end of the future year's defense program or the FIDIP. And what that shows is roughly 
about 2%, little under 2% growth for the remaining four years of the FIDIP. Um, that means in real terms, if that plan holds, which is also, I think, a big if, uh, you're going to see the defense budget shrink in real terms from this high point uh, that we're expecting to occur in FY19. Lauren? Yeah, no, I think that that's exactly right. It was it was kind of wild, actually, for the comptroller on the day that the budget was released to acknowledge that this was the plus up and that they were planning for inflation for the rest of the fight up. Well, and and uh, Norquist is, um, you know, an, a, a very, very seasoned hand at this, and he knows that, uh, you know, that, that there's a fiscal gravity here that everybody's dealing with. Let me ask you, you know, when you looked at um, the Air, you know, when you looked at both the Air Force, the Navy, and and in the Army case, what were some of the key takeaways that you took away from a service particular standpoint? Sure. So the Army certainly had the largest increase in a percentage wise, um, and you saw that kind of go to some new programs or, sorry, updating existing programs that they have. Um, the Air Force got the the least of the money, but in this year everyone did have a bump. So I think it was maybe a six percent increase. I can't recall off the top of my head. And then the Navy fell in between. Uh, yeah, well, the Navy had a nice plus, but you could look at it that it's two services that it's dealing with. Why did the Air Force, though, you know, a number of folks, you know, even airmen in particular, have talked about why, you know, that plus up was so small on the, uh, for the Air Force. You could argue that we're in a very strategic period and that actually the Air Force and the Navy are the two arms, especially if you're going to be trying to deal with both Russia and, and China, China in particular, is more important. Why is it that the Air Force seems to have gotten uh, the short end of the stick here? Yeah, it was really surprising to me to see the largest growth occurring in the Army, and, and most of that growth spent on making marginal improvements to systems that already exist versus investing in getting to those next generation of combat systems. Um, you know, the Air Force and their responsibilities for the nuclear, you know, two of the three legs of the nuclear triad for space, um, for developing, uh, you know, huge part of those capabilities are so important against uh in a potential conflict with China and Russia, this anti-axis area denial suite of capabilities, uh, it was it was surprising to me to see that al how that allocation turned out. I, I'm having trouble explaining it given where the strategy is. Yeah, it's, it is it is kind of surprising. No, I think that's exactly right. Um, do um, so. What do you what do you guys so what do you guys want this to grow up to be? Right. So what are some of the other features that you guys are looking at it? I saw that on military construction we only went down to two layers of detail. I was really disappointed. <laughs> no, I'm, j I'm joking. I mean, I got to tell you, like having waded through a lot of like Milcon stuff to understand it, it was really amazing to click on it and see how much there was in the Pacific, a lot of construction there and elsewhere in the world, and it was fascinating. And it's so pathetic to see the numbers that are for the Guard and the Reserve when you see them sort of, wow, you know, that's all that's being spent there. Um, you know, tell us, you know, what are the next phases that you guys want to bring online, you know, as this project continues? So um, this is our first time working with these interactive graphics. Uh, you'll see when you start to move through them that if you hover over certain acronyms or terms, you'll get a simple definition um, like NGJ, Next Gen Jammer, it'll tell you what it is, but it doesn't tell you any more than that. So that's a piece of functionality that we really like to add in a future, uh, a future iteration is like a better explanation of what all those programs are and what capabilities they bring to the joint force I think would help a lot of people out. Yeah, and I think another thing when we designed this program, this project, I should say, was that we were thinking about a resource library kind of framework for it. And so next year we can add on to this, but we can also do relative changes down to the specific levels that we've broken out at this lower tier. And we can add a lot of interesting analysis as we see what might just be a 2% increase next year. We can kind of measure the magnitude of that. Uh, that's, that's really, really cool. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, even though you think you know all the definitions for everything, that's a really, really big help because generally some of this is undifferentiated, and even the people using the acronyms have absolutely no idea what the acronym yeah. stands for. I've, so that's I found that myself. I found that I've had that problem myself. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really extraordinary. Lauren Fish, Susanna Bloom, both of the Defense Strategies and Assessments uh, branch of the Center for a New American Security. Thanks so very much. Best of all. Oh, and where can people get? So how are you guys taking feedback from, from your users who will tell you, oh my God, this is the greatest yeah. thing since sliced bread, or like burn it down and delete it? <laughs> All of these products can be found at cnas.org slash pb19. And you can follow both of us on Twitter, at Susanna V. Bloom and at Lauren Fish DC. Guys, thanks very, very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Vago. Thank you.